everybody. Welcome to the Week Ahead, a podcast by SBM Intelligence. I'm your host, Bissalance, and every Saturday, we look at some stories shaping our continent. In our first story, we dive into Nigeria's oil sector, where the Nigerian National Petroleum Company has declared a net profit of 3 trillion naira for 2023. This is its largest ever naira profit, but is this a cause for celebration? Next, we explore a development involving the Nigerian government as the French court authorizes the seizure of three presidential jets. This move follows a legal battle with a Chinese company over a revoked contract and an unpaid compensation award. What happened? Finally, we look at the growing tensions in Kenya as the government considers reintroducing tax measures that were previously scrapped after deadly protest. With the country's fiscal problems running deep and the Supreme Court temporarily suspending a key ruling, the risk of further unrest looms large. Joining me for in-depth insights and analysis on these critical stories are Sheyi and Kemisit F. Young. Welcome, Sheyi and Kemisit. Thank, Thank you for having me. Yeah, there was a pause, so I was wondering if you could, if you could hear me. All right, so uh, it's good to have you both there. So Sheyi will be helping us with the NMPC story, and then Kemisit will help us with the other two. So Sheyi, on on our first story, the NNPC recently announced a net profit of 3 trillion naira for 2023, and it stated that this was a 28% increase compared to their 2022 uh, profits. The NNPC also denied owing uh, international traders. So my question on this is going to be multifaceted, and I wanted to like just take a deep dive uh, into it, because despite reporting this profit, we still have four uh, strategies. Um, the NNPC, NNPC still owes uh, different traders and you know they are just different financial com uh, commitment and other issues so is this this particular announcement this particular news is this something to rejoice about is this claim true how did the NPC arrive at this profit and then if you were to compare this profit to their performance the performance of international pairs is this something we should take to the streets and start rejoicing is this a commendable fit thank you Oh, well, that's that's a lot of questions yeah. rolled into one, but I try to I try to do justice to it. So let's start from the last bit of your question about how comparing an NPC's performance to its international counterparts. So um, just to lay a foundation, Nigeria belongs to the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries (OPEC). And OPEC accounts for a major share of the world's uh, crude oil reserves. And so it's like a an, well, an organization, as the name signifies, where they agree on how they would sell the modalities for trading crude oil and, and all of that, all of that fine print. So when you compare an NPC's performance to the companies, the, the state-owned companies of these other oil exporting countries, then you see that NNPC has not done something fantastic, if we, if we could put it like that. Because um, first things first, we all know that the Naira has been devalued significantly between May 2023 and now. And so going by the exchange rate that the NNPC was using to report its financials to the Federation Account Allocation Committee. As of January last year, the NNPC was using an exchange rate of, of about 413 naira or thereabouts to the dollar. By December, that already went to 899 naira per dollar. So, and crude oil, because it's an international commodity, is trading in dollars. And NNPC trades crude oil on Nigeria's behalf. So, we can clearly see that. If NNPC is trading in dollars, by the time it will convert to Naira, because the Naira has been devalued, then the Naira figure would be significantly higher than what it would have been from the previous years, simply because of the Naira devaluation. Another thing is that, well, everyone has a fair idea of how trading and trading goes, buying and selling. So if you are reporting higher profits or your highest ever profits, then you should it should come along with um higher production levels. It means that you are doing something right. It means that you have more goods, for example. But if we check, 
Nigeria's uh, 2023 production numbers were among, was among some of the lowest in, in recent times. We have definitely not gotten back to the 1.7 million, 2 million per, them per day crude oil output. So the, this already shows, in fact, in 2023, NNPC, NNPC recorded production numbers of around 1 million compared to the years when we're doing 1.7 million. So all this shows that it's not something fantastic that um, we can we can rejoice about. Then as to whether or not they owe people, well, when when the news reports about NNPC's subsidy debts or NNPC's debts to refiners broke, the NNPC itself released a statement where it sort of admitted to owing these debts because it alluded to the fact that um, the international the international crude oil market is such that you deal with forward contract forward sale contracts and long term agreements and so it is normal to owe one another or for traders to owe and for sellers to owe at at some point in time during these these transactions. So um, is there any other thing I've left out? So I think that's, um, that's what I have to say. So if there's anything I've left out, you could please uh, let me know. You mean me? No, Peace. I was, I was oh, talking I to Peace. Oh, yeah. okay. All so right. She had, she asked like, a lot of questions. So I was not sure if I have captured everything. Yeah, I I I think my first question on that was to ask if it's or something to rejoice about. But I think you you cleared that there's still a lot of um there there are so many issues around it, you know. So this isn't really something to celebrate. All right. So my second question on on the NMPC. Recently, we heard that the NMPC has transferred the ownership of all its petrol stations to OVH, which is owned by uh the president's nephew Wale Tunubu. And I was just wondering the involvement of a family member of the president. How 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 is this? Um, uh, isn't this raising any concerns about potential conflicts of interest? You know, and is this a case of state capture? Did you just go through due process? Is there transparency, accountability uh, around this? How can we be so sure that this will serve the interest of uh, the public and not just the parties involved? Okay, so there's a bit of uh, misinformation going on around that uh, around that transaction. Actually, OVH is not owned by uh, the president's nephew, Alitin Yondo. So just to be clear, um, Oando, which Alitin Yondo has equity in, in which um, ownership own, they owned their, they had a downstream business which they which Oando then divested from and then its other partners Vital and uh, the other name is not, the second name is not coming to mind now but there are two in um, trading houses who now who took over those downstream so when we in downstream when you talk about downstream in the oil sector you're talking about the filling stations where you buy your petrol and diesel so and then um, Oando actually sold off its downstream sector um downstream part of his business to Vital and one other trader. And so they were the ones that NNPC merged with and bought OVH from. So according to the statement that was then released in reaction to these reports last night, that was Friday night, uh, the NNPC clarified that it's that's Wale Tinumbu, who is the president's nephew or cousin, not sure of the family relationship does not own does not own any part of OVH and that what is merely happening is that um, NNPC is merging its retail arm which is the NNPC filling station is merging the retail arm with OVH because when NNPC bought OVH they then had two businesses two different businesses that deal with retail selling of petrol and diesel so what nnpc is trying to do now is merge both but well rather than the the messaging was actually not clear 
So the NNPC could have done better by saying they were dissolving OVH and dissolving it into NNPC retail. But instead, they said they were dissolving NNPC retail into OVH, and then the name will become NNPC retail post-merger. So it, there's a bit of uh, misinformation around that, but uh, NNPC did not sell its downstream business to Valet Tenombo. All right, thank you, Shay. So uh, it can be said, I'll direct the final question on this topic uh, to you. Uh, in what ways can can the public hold uh, you know, the Nigerian uh, energy sector accountable in terms of transparency and accountability, especially regarding um, deals or different things like that. I mean, there are so many bad things about NMC that is shrouded in secrecy. So how exactly can the public hold them accountable in this area? Um, I think the critical, the, the critical link, right, and be found in a fair amount of Shea's comments. So she has had to preface a lot of her, uh, a lot of her analysis about the NNPC by saying, from what we know, according to their reporting, you know, and on and on. And that's the big gap, and that's the fundamental challenge with the NNPC, which is that it's this large, opaque, very convoluted and complicated entity, which does not, which does not do a lot of reporting about its, uh, which does not do a, a lot of reporting about its business, its financials, as well as its operations. As a matter of fact, we've only had a decent look about the true state of the NNPC probably within the last twelve to twenty-four months, right? And we're talking about an organization which has been around in one shape or the other since 1977. So what we're really dealing with, right, is to have a situation where now it is a nominally public company. Now it has taken substantial amounts of debt and it has uh, outstanding commitments to a significant range of stakeholders. What the NPC really needs to do and where that will put all of us in the best place to demand uh, accountability and better scrutinize its operations is for it to disclose more. And hopefully the fact that it's dealing with a lot of um, international partners and uh, it has to uh, report on a lot of its financials would mean that we would continue to get a better sense about the company and its operations. And that would hopefully help us um, keep it you know, more on the straight and narrow. All right, thank you. So moving on to the next story, which is about uh, the seizure of three presidential jets. Uh, so the French court, a French court has authorized the seizure of three presidential jets belonging to um, the federal government. So it can be said out to uh, just explain the details of this, of the particular, of the contract with the Ogun state government and why it led to such uh, legal action. Okay, so this particular Chinese company called um, Zongshan was awarded an export processing zone management contract by the Ogun State government. That was about in 2016, right? And a rather, it was not awarded a contract in 2016, but a contract that was awarded to it by the Ogun State government and guaranteed by the federal government was revoked by Ogun State in 2016, apparently without notice. And um, in the legal proceedings that followed, right, one in France and another one in Quebec, in, in Canada, right, it appears as though the revocation was done outside of the tenants and the agreements, right, of the original export processing zone management and contract. And so this company, right, took Nigeria itself, right, to uh, various tribunals around the world seeking compensation for the, the revocation of that contract. And what, um, what happened, right, uh, over the past week was that, um, you know, a Canadian court as well as a French court ordered uh, the seizure of two jets from Nigeria's uh, presidential, or rather three and jets from Nigeria's presidential field as satisfaction of the legal term for it, but basically to pay off the compensatory awards that have been 
uh, you know, that have been offered by, by the court, something um, to the tune of 74.5, uh, $74.5 million, right? The, the, there, were, there are also important details around uh, the fact that the legal team, that legal team of teams that were representing Nigeria, you know, either did not get um, the court summons on time, or they were a bit like a deathical in responding to the tribunal summons, as well as defining um, a case for the Nigerian state. And so we were consistently behind, right, the our legal deadlines for filing our briefs, and also the the legal arguments that the the country's legal team eventually chose to to make around sovereign immunity and sovereign immunity and how that that in, in essence precludes Nigeria right from being liable for the compensation of for paying of the and the compensation awards, right? You know, those were also rejected by the tribunals in both of those um, countries, um, as it were. So that's the real summary of what is turning out to, uh, you know, turning out to be a really embarrassing case for, for Nigeria. All right, so uh, so what does this say? How does this reflect on the uh, broader problem of our inconsistent governance practices in Nigeria? especially with regard to honoring international agreements or handling our legal and financial obligations? Um, I think it says a lot. I mean, if, if first is that there's a well-established uh, practice within the Nigerian polity where incoming governments often unilaterally counsel contracts, is honor agreements and target individuals or entities associated with previous administrations without due process. This contract was, the export zone management contract was cancelled in 2016, which was under a year after uh, there was a transition and a change of power, right, in, in Ogun State. You know, such actions undermine the rule of law and damage, ultimately, Nigeria's credibility on, on the global stage. We've had um, situations with cases such like the PNID case, where essentially a, a commitment by the Nigerian state to uh, a commitment by the Nigerian state to pay up right uh, some consultants who had helped Nigeria recover right some stranded funds overseas morphed into you know a really bizarre and embarrassing case that played its way out through you know you know, through and um, through the court system in the United Kingdom to the tune of billions of dollars. And this was in the, you know, in the early Buhari. Yeah, so right about this time, this contract was being revoked and this particular issue was arising, right? You know, this underscores the fact that you know, investors, uh, business people, entrepreneurs, right around the world, and, you know, are really getting into a, a posture where they may begin to mark Nigeria with an asterisk in terms of investability. The key thing about um, securing a foreign investment is, you know, first the, the credibility on the part of the country or wherever it is that is on the other side of the table signing the dotted lines to stick to their commitments, but also the certainty that contracts can, you know, transition to an outlast Right, democratic transitions, a change of power, new governments, or even if there is going to be a determination of the contract. If, say, um, Nigeria or a Nigerian state wants to vary the terms of an agreement, that there's a predictable legal and judicial and administrative process to go through that, and you don't have contracts being cancelled just by, you know, <laughs> sending a letter or essentially communicating. In some cases, communication isn't even given, right, with respect to, to these things. So, you know, that attitude has to change. If not, there's no way this administration, as well as the administration of many states, which is, you, you know, which is based on, um, a, you know, a large dose of foreign investments flowing into the country. There's no way that strategy is going to see the light of it. 
All right. Uh, thank you. So we're just going to move to our last story, which is about Kenya. Um, so Kenya's government recently announced that they will reintroduce some tax uh measures. Although the Supreme Court said that this is to maintain budget stability until the government appeal uh next month. But as it is, there's been there's already like a threat of uh protest returning. So uh I want to just uh, explain, you know, what why why did the Kenya government consider introducing tax measures, considering that the last time they introduced it, it led to deadly protest. Yeah, okay, so this is where sort of the um, political reality of the um the the, the, the wide unpopularity of instituting these tax measures collides with the fiscal reality of where Kenya's economic situation is. Now, the, the, the government in Nairobi basically is saying that, you know, while some measures will be tweaked, there are expenditure items such as teachers' wages, as essentially public sector wages and commitments that need to be funded. And so some of these some of these proposed tax measures, right, which were um, originally scrapped as others protest in June, may have to be reintroduced. Now it's worth noting that there's a legal process that's currently playing out separate to, but somewhat related to the political conversation about having these tax measures reintroduced that that that's sort of playing out right now. Kenya's Supreme Court temporarily suspended the Court of Appeal ruling that declared that the law, the 2023 law, which formed the basis of the original, of the introduction of the original measures that led to the process was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court is supposed to have a hearing on that law's constitutionality on the 10th and the 11th of September, so right about the, the middle of September. But some of the economic reality Right, so the situation is that Kenya is on an IMF, um, you know, debt restructuring program. These measures, which were introduced with the aim to boost tax revenue and reduce external borrowing, were part of the conditions of a three point six billion dollar funding package that was agreed right by the you know by the IMF. Kenya right now has a debt to GDP ratio of about 70%, which for an emerging market is pretty significant, right? Simply means, you know, any sort of variance or any sort of uncertainty in its economic situation would easily tip it into debt unsustainability. And the original um, package aims to generate about two points, an additional $2.7 billion dollars by the end of fiscal year 2024. Now, obviously, we are at the tail end of August 2024. That bill ended up, you know, that law ended up not being implemented because of the political, you know, and the social situation, right, that, you know, that it spawned, especially with the protests, the side of William Ruto's, you know, uh, cabinet and, you know, all of the political machinations that, also came up um, as a result. But I suppose the fundamental driver of the current political uncertainty that surrounded this bill is the fact that Kenyans simply don't trust their governments, right? You know, you have a situation where political party affiliation um, you know, has dwindled for the first time in, in Kenyan political history. The proportion of Kenyans who say they belong to a political party is right sense. This is a number that over the last two decades have overed around 70%. Amongst young Kenyans, right, um, you're seeing an increasing disengagement from formal politics. Young Kenyans, um, the proportion of young Kenyans that are not affiliated with the political party is about half now, right? And you also have a situation where Youth voter registration is down. Turnout was down, right, for the elections that brought Ruto into power in, in 2022, right? And there's this perception of corruption, of capital cronyism, people being 
and people getting contracts and people living off of the the economic largesse of being connected to uh, politicians in those countries. And so for many, particularly for young Kenyans, Kenyans 35 and under, the conversation and the demands that many of them are making is, you know, why the entire country essentially has to put the bill in terms of increased uh, tax measures, right, for a situation which many believe was largely caused, right, by the ruling elite. Some of the tax measures which the government is looking to reintroduce are actually things which will not affect a broad amount of Kenyans, except for a rise in value-added tax, which is a consumption tax that everybody has to pay. But some of the tax measures which include an increase in tax, actually, for the top 10%, right, um, of, of Kenyans have still been met with that sense of unpopularity because, again, that trust deficit is absent. And many, many people basically think, oh, okay, Ruto wants to tax the richest people a bit more now, but if the economic picture does not turn around, right, for the better within the next one to two years and the IMF makes, you know, even more demands, right, there's a possibility that that increased tax bracket is expanded to include more middle class Kenyans. So there's a trust gap that Kenya has to um, that Kenya has to figure you know figure out right you know a, a way of uh, resolving and uh, it's 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 unclear that it's unclear that William Ruto still has any residual political capital rights to make that happen. And the final uh, point the summation I would make is Kenya is one of the better African economies. A lot of the structural issues that Kenya is dealing with are shared by a host of other African economies, especially the big economy. And so um, it, just as much of the continent looks to the protests right in Kenya as sort of a litmus test of how a uh, popular citizens' action can push back against unpopular economic policies. We are also looking at a case where um, Kenya may, you know, Kenya is increasingly being looked at as an example of how, you know, revitalizing an emerging economy on the continent can be done without, you know, people burning things up and without a heightened level of political instability. All right. Uh, thank you. So, but is there any way in which uh, President William Ruto can balance the economic priorities of of, of Kenya with the growing demands of the youth population. I understand you mentioned that there's an increasing um, uh, disengagement with politics and growing trust or mistrust or distrust in the government. But is there any way to create a balance that works that, uh, that, that works for the country and at the same time it's not too harsh on citizens? I think mean to be fair, that there is a way, but I mean, that, that there are some ways, but um, it's going to be quite difficult considering the political environment in which Bruto is trying to do this. I think a big thing would be to cut the size of governments. That's usually, you know, sends a clear and an immediate signal that government is trying to be responsible in the management of its own finances, and that gives it something of a of, you know, something of a credibility booster, booster shot, right? In terms of basically telling people that it is fiscally responsible to manage, right? The the, the wider economy, you know, William Ruto came under a lot of stick for, um, you know, for having a cabinet, which was which was quite large, I mean, not large by African standards, but in many Kenyans still saw his cabinet as a big bloated. So he, his decision to, basically sat the entire cabinet was greeted um was greeted positively but he could have gone for it he could have defined maybe pushed through a legal amendment which tightly proscribes what the size of you know of, of government is uh you know uh, policies around um, increasing digitization but also specific economic measures to ameliorate the pain for a lot of lower income Kenyans, especially Kenyans who are in the informal economy, who are day labor um, earners or you know, daily wage earners, um, as it were, 
those are some of the kind of priorities that the government needs to you know first define and design but also amplify the challenge with a lot of economic reform efforts on the continent and you see this in nigeria you've seen this in ghana you've seen this in south africa as well is that a lot of the structural economical reforms right around increasing the tax brackets getting more people to pay taxes around increasing the prices of essential commodities so that there's a more market determined price mechanism often isn't paired with cushioning the effect of those initial price hikes for a lot of lower income or public sector earners within those economies african Yeah, you can miss that. Stop daring you. Okay, can you? I can hear you now, yeah. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so... Oh, yeah. Yeah. And with, was that policymakers in the 70s? This is in the 80s. Can't have a situation, the pain of economic reform Right, is administered in full to taxpayers and you know and wage earners and income earners without any sort of cushion for the most vulnerable members of society. There are many African economies that have very a very high proportion of their populations living in poverty. There are many many Africans who may in the long run be the ultimate beneficiaries of these reform efforts if they are carried out in good faith. I should add. But in the short term, we'll be dealing with a lot of economic stress and a lot of economic pain. And so policymakers need to, to use a term that a Nigerian commentator who, you know, I, I was reading, you know, last week just said, um, they need to carry out policy with a human face, right? Um, you know, there are people within those economies that can obviously afford, you know, tax hikes, but it doesn't have to be for everyone, at least not in the short term. Until so the focus has to be on economic growth, but reform has to have a growth agenda that also carries everybody along. All right, thank you, right. thank you. If not, you still have a situation where we have a lot of people. Okay. Oh, sorry, there was a break, so I thought maybe you were done. I didn't know it was the network. Okay, can oh, okay. You... Uh, yeah, there are no troubles at all. I think the key thing is just to is just to recognize that reform has to be paired with, you know, I, I don't like the word palliative, but that seems to be the only thing that comes to mind. But reform has to be paired with measures to cushion the pain, at least in the short to the medium term, right? So that, again, it creates that positive feedback loop where people can see that their government is really trying to change as well as change things for the better, and people may be more willing to give, you know, governments such as and the one in Nairobi a bit more time and a bit more of the benefits of the doubt to actually push through, right, the, the wider work of economic reform. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sheyi and Ekemi Seeds for participating in today's episode. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And to all our listeners, this podcast is by SBM Intelligence. For deeper insight into our work, please visit our website at sbmintel.com. And remember to connect with us on social media, X, Facebook, and LinkedIn at SBM Intelligence. That will be all for today. Thank you for listening.